introduce our panel. As you might imagine, we have a tight time frame, about 45 minutes, to talk about the complexities of addiction and treatment. Um, so as you imagine, we're going to go very quickly. We are going to have, hopefully, some time at the end to have questions um, from you guys, because they're probably better questions than I ask anyway. Um, but first, uh, we'd like to welcome the Honorable uh, Shan um, Shante Owens uh, to the panel. Um, she serves as the Jefferson County Drug Court uh, judge. Uh, then we have Carissa Anthony uh, with Homewood City Schools um, for a safe and uh, drug-free Homewood. Then Melody Green, who's the assist assistant uh, superintendent uh, for Hoover City Schools. Uh, Foster Cook, who many of you uh, well know with UAB Task. And then last on our panel, but not least, Pamela Butler with the Department of Mental Health um, out of Montgomery. So first I'd like to give each of you kind of just a few seconds to kind of talk about what they do and how they help the community. Okay. Judge Owens. Good afternoon. I am the presiding judge of the Jefferson County Adult Drug Court Program. Um, at present, we have almost 500 um, active participants in our drug court program, making it the largest program in the state of Alabama. Um, because I run the Adult Drug Court Program, we don't oversee any misdemeanor cases. These are all felony cases where defendants are charged with unlawful possession of a controlled substance, unlawful possession of marijuana first degree. There are no manufacturing first degree cases that can come into drug court, no trafficking cases, distribution cases. We do a really good job of trying to weed out the drug seller versus the addict. Um, in drug court, I buy by one rule. I tell them as long as they try, I will continue to try. There are some people who are in the drug court program who have been in before I took the bench. But as long as they're working the program, I will never send them to prison for relapse, but I will send them to prison for other reasons, um, which all of my participants know. They know that they can go to prison if they divert a drug specimen in any way. If they tamper with the drug screen, that is an automatic prison sentence. I tell them that is the only unforgivable sin of drug court. Anything else you can be forgiven for, because I won't tolerate relapse, but I will definitely work, work with you and we will understand it. There are consequences to relapse, but you will never go to prison for relapsing. We have a really good team of people who are committed, not only me, but our case managers, our drug court um, coordinator, we are really committed to helping solve addiction, to working through the process. Carissa? Um, I work with uh, Homewood City Schools right now. I am their prevention and development coordinator, so I work in the schools to implement prevention programming, but then also I also coordinate a community drug prevention coalition. And prior to that, I actually worked in Hoover doing the exact same thing. So for the past dozen years, my focus has been on preventing youth substance use by engaging the entire community with a strategic plan to accomplish a specific mission. Melody. Thank you. One of my primary responsibilities and also one of my passions is to educate children against making bad decisions. We call that officially behavior management, we call it intervention, we call it many, many things. But the bottom line is about kids and it's about our kids, yours and mine, our children, our grandchildren, uh, and all of the people who will grow up to take care of us hopefully in our old age. Um, we have a three-pronged approach to this responsibility and that is first of all education, secondly um, prevention, and then thirdly intervention. So that is uh, our goal is to hit those three prongs and hopefully to give each student an opportunity to make good decisions and ammunition against making bad decisions. Foster. Uh, I'm Foster Cook and I'm the uh, director of uh, the substance abuse program in the Department of Psychiatry at UAB and also the director of the TASC program which uh, supports Judge Owens uh, with the staff and, and uh, the funding to run her drug court as well as drug courts uh, in Bessemer at Family Court, Family Dependency Court. We also are involved in uh, a number of alternatives of, uh, to incarceration programs that we provide for all the courts in Jefferson County. And uh, plus we do drug prevention too, particularly in the uh, school system in Tarrant. And I'm glad to be here. Pamela. I'm Pam Butler. I'm with the Alabama Department of Mental Health. I am responsible for the recovery resources within the community, treatment resources. And um, mainly I'm responsible for changing the way we deliver services to our consumers in the state of Alabama. So I'm on a big education mission to educate people on a new recovery oriented system of care using more evidence-based practice and more individualized treatment. Pam, I'd like to start with you. Um, as somebody 
is very vocal about her recovery process. Would you just kind of let us understand what addiction is and talk about what that was like for you and then also how you found recovery very briefly? Yeah, um, I mean, I'm a recovering addict. I'm, my date is May, May the 21st, 1993. Um, you know, do the math on that, that's 21 years. Most of the time the room go, woo! But <laughs> And that's a blessing, but the reality of it is, is that I've been around using drugs for 30 years. So that meant a 10, nine to 10 year period, I was relapsing, delivering crack babies, running my parents crazy, uh, stealing, committing crimes. They wouldn't have no drug courts. See, I wouldn't have felonies if they'd have had drug courts back then. You know, so it's just one of those things I want people to understand that I am the product of recovery. You know, I worked in this field for 18 years, and some of the things that, you know, when I look back over my life, how I found recovery was, my, my, my parents had to get some education. My mom was an enabler. I heard some family members in here, and it always breaks my heart, because out of all the things I did in my addiction, hurting my family members was one of the hardest things, and that's one of the hardest things that I had to work on forgiving myself for. But I did a lot of, a lot of things that I wasn't proud of, lost a lot of, you know, friends and families. You know, some of us recovering people in this room, we've been listening and, you know, and, and we can be sarcastic sometimes so y'all know it. We've been going, wow, it took them 30 years to catch up with the rest of us. You know, but the reality of it is we are grateful for this conference. You know, we are grateful to see that this community is coming out against this because we've been, we, we in recovery have been burying people at, since we started. And so we understand that this disease kill the doctor before me made mention of, we want to make sure that we don't just realize that we got a, we got a drug addiction throughout the state. And part of what my, my, my thing was is that I, I'm, I'm classic. I started with the marijuana. I moved on up, and I started doing other things. And I want people to know I graduated with a degree in chemical engineering and, you know, started smoking cocaine back in the, back in the early 80s. So... You know, and I smoked cocaine throughout until 1993. Now, what's different for me, I would like to tell you with some kind of magic, I know my mom stopped enabling me helped out a lot because I never really was homeless. I never really was. I never really had consequences until my family stopped enabling me. I have been to treatment many, many times, and that's why I want people to understand I am the product of about 15 treatment centers. So I don't want people to think when people go to treatment and they don't get better, thank God somebody let me do number 15. Thank God. So I'm, this is, I have, I'm not a bad person. I have a medical condition that needs to be treated. And I want people to understand that addiction is a medical condition that needs to be treated, but we have to give people the individualized treatment that they need, and that's what we're working towards. But I go to 12-step meetings. I go to Celebrate Recovery. I just got a pamphlet for Heron Anonymous. I ain't never did no Heron, but I'm going because it looked like that's somewhere I can be. You know, <laughs> I mean, I want people to know we recovering community. That's just how we roll. We roll like that, you know, and... I am so fortunate to be, I am a success story. I work at the Alabama Department of Mental Health. And 25 years ago, when I was standing on the corner with some crack in my pocket, selling it before I smoked it up, you know, because I don't know which one was going to come first. Um, I want to make sure you understand that's where I was 25 years ago, standing on the corner with some crack in my pocket, delivering crack babies. And now I am the coordinator, the only coordinator of recovery resources for the state of Alabama. Thank you, Pam. Judge Owens, your court might be the first stop for somebody that's in the process of addiction. You know, what um, are you seeing in terms of heroin and pill usage as a growing problem? And what are the demographics that you're starting to see come through your court? You know, I, when I speak to different groups, I always tell them that I think my courtroom is the courtroom where I will, I will see some of everyone from young, old, rich, poor, I see just as many um, poor defendants as I see those from affluent neighborhoods who come from good families. And heroin and opiate addiction is all behind all of it. Um, I, I think the oldest person I have in drug court is somewhere close to 80 years old, and the youngest person is about 18 years old. But it runs the gambit. You know, there aren't any 
set types of defendants that I see on a daily basis. I will see young, old, I'll see professional. I see lots of nurses. We have quite a few uh, professionals in our drug court program. We, I have a number of college students in, uh, in the drug court program whose drug of choice is heroin, a number of college students. And, you know, and it really, really breaks my heart because when I took the bench maybe about six years ago, there were a few heroin cases, and there were some, but the bulk of the cases in drug court at the time, six years ago were cocaine cases. Now, when someone, you know, is a cocaine addict in drug court, you know, I'm like, whew, well, that's it. You know, I, I don't look at it as badly as I look at um, as the number of heroin cases that we have, because it is amazing the number of heroin cases that we have where the drug of choice is heroin. And just recently, we've started testing um, specifically for heroin, because before we would just, our tests would only indicate opiate. And so a lot of the uh, heroin addicts, they would just tell me, oh, I just took a Loratab because I had a, you know, a, a toothache. You know, that is the number one excuse. I went to the dentist, had a toothache, he gave me a Loratab. And now it is interesting to see when I tell them, look, I have a test in front of me, don't lie. Let's, before you answer that, I want you to know that I already know the answer to it. And I think that we are making um, some headway in our drug court program, but it is amazing the number of heroin addicts that we have. And I tell you, we have almost 500 participants in drug court, and it's very sad to see the number of young people, young women, young men, boys and girls. Foster, as somebody in the treatment field, uh, when did you first start to notice this rise in opiate use and opiate addiction? Well, we've had opiate abuse and addiction uh, as long as I've been in the field. Uh, UAB used to uh, run a methadone clinic. I was the administrator for that. Uh, so I, my experience with, uh, with seeing people with this disorder it goes back for years and years. I, I, think, I think what's happened uh, or what appeared to happen to me, I think we've had described by the other panelists, and that was a change in terms of the progression from people from prescription drugs to, uh, to, to heroin. And that, to me, really started happening in 2010 and 2011. Uh, one of the, the first, uh, I think the first indicators we had were, was a little bit of change in the population that we had in drug court. Uh, previously, it was, uh, we had a lot of cases that we had, Some, uh, a lot of them were women, where uh, the drug of abuse was Loratabs, uh, 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 forged prescriptions, we had a lot of forged prescriptions, and that was most of the opiates that we were seeing other than the longer term kinds of addicts that, that kind of come in and out of the system. But during that time, we started seeing a kind of a different uh, manifestation of opiate dependence and um, and and then all of a sudden we had this real acceleration back in 2013 and 2014 that we that we were tracking uh, I went back and looked at the last uh, couple of months just to see what we were seeing uh, we had 70 people in the program test positive uh, for heroin a lot of them have just come into the program since March and we've had seven overdose deaths among our uh, task population of, of people that we're serving out of the criminal justice system that's happened since March. And, and that is, that's the most we've had, but that has been something that uh, has happened uh, all, most recently. It seems like we're, we're really in a, at a critical point in terms of what we're seeing. Pam, why is this a problem for Birmingham in particular? I mean, we're seeing this issue rise, I guess, more rapidly here. Why do you think that is? Well, I think, I think it goes back to what Foster and some people said earlier. We already had a culture of people using opiates, and I want people to understand about opiate addiction. It's not one of those addictions like I had. We were all here in the crack house peeping out at y'all. Well, that's not what's going on with opiate addiction. I know, I'm sorry. You know, okay. but I'm so real. It's okay, baby. Um, you know, Opiate addiction is different. I can go to the club, I can go to the mall, I can clean my house up. I get this burst of energy. So I think we already had that culture of people who were using opiates anyway. And so when this cheaper form came along, I want people to understand, I'm not gonna take the uh, chance of going to the pharmacy trying to get a prescription, you know, forge a script when I can go to the neighborhood dope dealer and get it for cheaper anyway. So mm -hmm. I think, and, and we're, we have to become a more Community, recovery community friendly community 
and I think those things was why. Judge Owens, what are the personal consequences of an opiate addict? For me, I can say in my courtroom, I have a lot more uh, in the drug court program who are locked up in the county jail awaiting beds um, for fear of overdosing because I think the week that I was called to ask to participate in this was one week where three people in my courtroom died of an overdose. Two of them were in drug court and one was just on my regular docket. Three people in one week, you know, those are not my children, but I can only imagine the way the parents felt, you know, because I somehow I always feel like the mother hen of everyone that comes before me. And that week was just really, really overwhelming for me. So a personal consequence, if I know someone is an opiate addict, for me is that you will probably spend a great deal of time in the county jail awaiting a treatment bed. And I'll give any, uh, any addict, but especially an opiate addict, as many times as Pam stated, you know, it took her 15 times. And that's why when I initially took the bench, I remember reading something about drug court. On your third strike, uh, you're out and you, uh, you'll be sentenced out of the program. I would not have anybody in drug court right now if I, you know, if I took that approach, three strikes and you're out of the program. So, you know, we did away with counting up the number of sanctions, and, but if it means that I have to, you know, sometimes use the county jail as a, a holding facility until we can get you into a bed, then that's what I will do. And, you know, I'm a former prosecutor, so sending people to prison does not bother me at all. I kind of <laughs> like it sometimes. And, and if I have to send somebody to prison to save their lives, then I'm not afraid to do that either. I had a young man in court last week who is a sickle cell uh, patient. And, but what we found out was that he was using the disease, and we know that he's in pain sometimes, but he used it as an excuse for two and a half years in drug court. And before our test could detect that it was heroin, he would always just tell us, oh, I'm just taking, you know, a Lortab because I'm in so much pain. Well, we didn't tell him that we started testing for heroin. And what we were saying was that it was heroin each time. And, you know, it just got to the point where, as I felt being the judge, that the best way to save his life at this point was to send him to prison. So, you know, that's another personal consequence that you will suffer. But there are definitely um, hold, there is a definite a longer holding time for me in the county jail. I'm not afraid to use the county jail because I don't want another person to die on me and I'm not afraid to send someone to prison if I think that it will save their lives for some amount of time to keep them clean, you know, because I, I think it's bad when, when we get to the point, you know, as I said, I'm a former prosecutor, but if I can get a heroin addict to just smoke marijuana, I feel like, whoo, yes, we've done it. So. <laughs> Foster, what are the standards of care for opiate treatment? The standards of care for opiate treatment are standards that need to evolve really out of the individualized assessment for the, for the person that you're dealing with. Uh, and, uh, you know, without di diminishing any form of treatment or putting one above the other, it needs to be matched most effectively for, to the person that you have. Uh, their history, the amount of strengths that they have that they bring to the treatment process, uh, whether or not they've got insurance or not has something to do with it, I'm afraid. Uh, but, but generally in the literature, medication-assisted treatment is the, uh, seen as the treatment of choice. And that because, that's because a lot of the things that we heard earlier today with, uh, with opiate addicts and whatever are, are that it takes a long time for the brain to clear it takes uh, you know, 90 to 120 days usually to really detox someone appropriately and, and, and medication support is, uh, is seen as the, as the treatment of choice. Uh, buprenorphine, uh, methadone, uh, maybe now trexone at the end uh, as, uh, you know, as, is, is being used, but th th that's basically where you are to try to get some sort of stability and some sort of support for working toward long-term recovery. Now, just to say in terms of evidence-based practices, uh, I, think, I think when uh, Brandon, uh, I think he's still here, was up here talking about drug court and talking about the leverage that can be applied to a person that can compel them to participate in a drug treatment program and to follow through. That's an evidence-based practice. And that's uh, because a lot of times leverage uh, and support and sanctions and incentives to move forward in treatment can be the critical components for people about whether or not they engage in the treatment process. So I, I would say that that's, 
you know, it's, it's not just a medical thing, it's, it's the array of policies and strategies that we can come up with to make, to compel a person to go into treatment and to stay into treatment. Uh, one of the things that was most disappointing to me, uh, we had an evidence-based practice uh, was, uh, that w where we were doing assessments on every person that was released from the county jail from 1996 to 2011 when the county went bankrupt. That meant that every person that got out of the county jail had to come to get a drug test and had to uh, have some sort of assessment about whether or not there was uh, a need for services or treatment or whatever. And it also provided judges with, uh, with information to set bond conditions and whatever. All that went away. And so now a lot of times, and, but that, the evaluation of that approach was such that, it, that it, we really got a lot of people very early into, into treatment. So, uh, you know, but basically without talking about all the issues related to, to evidence-based practices, I would say that in the long run and in the end, the amount of social support that a person has, the amount of family support uh, that uh, attempts to, uh, to try to deal with them without stigmatizing them, all of those things uh, are extremely important to, to long-term recovery. Melody, what do you think the, is fueling this issue of opiate use at the individual level? Well, I would love to say that marijuana is the gateway drug for our students. Um, that's an, an easy, identifiable enemy to fight. But in education, we have found that we have primed our children as a society. In fact, I think the gateway drug is probably children's Tylenol. Uh, our children grow up being medicated, um, it, we squirt it in their mouth, pour it down their throats, hand them a pill, take them to the doctor every time we turn around. And not only that, we model drug use. And so they grow up with an awareness and a knowledge that there is better living through pharmaceuticals and our intentions are very good, but although they have that knowledge, they don't have the emotional maturity to discern um, what is medically acceptable from what is abuse. They see uh, their mom and her best friend swap muscle relaxants and Laura tabs, and they hear their parents talk about, well, if you can't sleep, Ambien, that's what you need right there. Uh, we have multiple aisles of pharmaceuticals and vitamins and uh, all kinds of aids to help us in our stores. So by the time our children get there, um, get to the point where they're making these decisions, they have had a lifetime of both being medicated for good many times uh, and also of seeing their parents live a style of medication. I mean, look at the commercials on TV. You have these beautiful bucolic scenes of um, families out having fun at the beach and underneath, and the risk of this might be heart attack or fatal failure, and all that's going on at the bottom. But the graphic image our students are left with, our children are left with is, if you just take this drug, everything's gonna be fine. And they hear that over and over from their earliest years. And again, the knowledge is there, but the emotional maturity is not. Then you add to that that we have a society of instant gratification. I mean, I get irritated if something doesn't download in under three seconds. Mm -hmm. um, we you know, drive up and down the road as fast as we can go. We have to get here and there. And again, our children grow up with hurry, hurry, get in the car. We've got to get to soccer practice. We've got to get to this and everything is now, 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 now. So when you combine that knowledge of um, drugs and their immature understanding of what drugs do with the I can have it now, we can, do it, we can go through the drive through and get supper, we can do whatever, and then at the very point when they have to start making decisions about drugs, they are at a stage in their life where they don't listen to parents, they listen to peers. They're in a natural state of rebellion, and that's part of that adolescent behavior. But unfortunately, it comes at a time when um, they are also confronted with many very difficult decisions. We've seen in education, we talk about this frequently, the fact that what we used to see in college, we now see in high school, what was in high school, we see in middle school, and we have elementary school students um, who are exhibiting behaviors from middle school. 
uh, I would venture to say if you walk into an elementary school into the nurse's office and ask to see the medication cabinet, it's relatively impressive. Mm -hmm. There are many things in there. And so they see their peers go into the nurse's office to take medicine. They see um, their parents demanding things. They get things immediately. And then they reach an age where they're being offered uh, marijuana, for example, and that's probably their first illegal gateway drug. Um, and they don't have anything to stop them. The barriers have been so wallowed down that it's just a matter of stepping over that line. Teenage mentality at that point takes over because once you've stepped over that line, you know, there's no going back. So you might as well smoke more and you might as well take more. And um, we're really seeing that. Then you add to that what I call the college connection. Uh, you have students going off to college more for an extended adolescence than for an educational experience. They have uh, additional discretionary money. They have little parental supervision. They have really kind of a laissez-faire attitude by parents of, well, this is where they sow their wild oats because parents are thinking back of when they were in college and the worst thing that, that really happened was maybe you drank too much or you know, something of that nature. But I don't think parents have a realistic understanding of the drug cultures that are on many campuses. So now we've sent them off. They have no support from parents because they are independent. They have too much money, too much time, and not enough emotional maturity, and a legacy of watching drugs be an integral part of their lives. So I, I firmly believe that that's why you're seeing an increase in the age group uh, under 30 at this point. Carissa, what do you think parents can do to make a difference? I think parents have to start talking to their kids at a very young age. Mm -hmm. um, whenever you look at the age of onset, and it varies community by community uh, when kids start to experiment with drugs. You know, most of the communities I've worked with is 12 and 13 years old. Uh, other communities, it may be as low as nine years old. So that puts you down in fourth, maybe fifth grade. Um, so they definitely have to start talking early and the conversations aren't necessarily always going to be about don't do drugs or here's what drugs will do to you and, and you know the worst case scenario. It's those conversations that help to build, for example, emotion, what I call emotional assets or competencies in kids. Like how do you handle your emotions in a healthy way as opposed to turning to some unhealthy behaviors to, to handle your emotions. Um, modeling some of that is a good thing if parents model their own ability to regulate emotions in a healthy way. Also talking to kids about how they're going to be as social beings, like how do you connect with other people socially in a proper way? Um, how do you connect with pro-social organizations, clubs, friends, that kind of stuff. So some of the conversations need to be sort of on the basic level like that. And then you move into really just teaching them good decision making. You know, how do you analyze a situation? Because they are growing up in a toxic culture. They are bombarded with a lot of really negative messages, negative images that are telling them to participate in all these unhealthy behaviors. Um, so really helping them think through, you know, decision-making process, how to make analyze the situation, make good choices, that kind of stuff. So that's important, and it just really can't start too, too early. Um, the other thing is for parents to not be afraid of, of setting high expectations and saying, here's what I expect of you. Um, and when they don't meet those expectations, give them reasonable consequences for that. Um, you know, it's, so, it's such a difficult situation, I think, as a parent or to, to look at your child growing up and they look all grown up on the outside. And so you naturally start to sort of slip into this thing of letting them have more freedom and, and expecting them to make adult-like decisions. And then all of a sudden you realize they do something and you're like, whoa, you are not there yet. Your emotional maturity, your mental maturity, that, that region of your brain that, that controls your judgment and helps you think into the future, it's not there yet. And for many kids, I mean, that's really not going to be there until they're like 25 or so. And for some people, it might even be 35. And y'all may know some of those, okay? Um, I have a brother. I could go on anyway. Uh, but, you know, so parents, we really have to hold their hand for a while. If you think about it, you have to be their judgment for a long time. And it does, it always scares me, that whole idea of going off to college. 
because I, I see so many kids today, I don't think they're ready for that. I really don't, and I think we're almost setting them up um, for failure, and yet, you know, I mean, whenever I was growing up, I went to a junior college my first year. My parents didn't let me go away to college. They were like, you are not ready. And I think today, parents would feel such pressure if they chose that for their child and said, look, you're just not ready. You're going to need to stay at home for one more year, and let's do it this way. So, you know, early conversations, and sometimes just as a parent, uh, connecting with other, other parents who, who have this, a similar life view as you so that you have a little support because it's not going to be easy to be the parent, um, you know, that makes those hard decisions. Um, as we start to wind down a little bit, just a few more questions. Pamela, what resources are available for individuals out there? Well, we have um, many certified programs on the adolescent and, and the adult side. There are actually 17 adolescent programs with two being uh, residential and uh, the 15 being uh, on an outpatient basis, and that can range anywhere from outpatient. There are actually 172 outba- outpatient type programs throughout the state of Alabama. Unfortunately, we only have two detox facilities in the state of Alabama, and we're in the middle of an opiate epidemic. So with the heroin epidemic and only two detoxes, that is one of the places that we have to do the most. But there are, and I do want to mention too, that we have 22 certified methadone programs in the state of Alabama. And, and I want people to understand, as Foster said earlier, methadone is an accept, it's acceptable, certified form of care in the state of Alabama. And as Judge said, somebody that's, we got to remember if a person is going to, there are people who go to the methadone clinic who do exactly what they're supposed to do. They are no different than somebody who's taking insulin for their diabetes. And we want to make sure that we, we understand that that is a certified program. But we definitely have 33 residential programs, and that can range anywhere from um, a more transitional living all the way up to our crisis residential. So there are definitely resources and I would challenge people to look on our website because more people using drugs don't have insurance, don't have money. And one thing about it, no state funded program can deny people the right to treatment due to their inability to pay. And we at the state office want to make sure if there are agencies that get funding from us denying people the right to treatment. We want to make sure that we know about that. And we have an excellent tool out there. Foster talked earlier about an assessment. We finally have a tool in Alabama that places people in the right level of care. I'm not sure if all my 15 treatment centers I should have been sitting residential. Some of them should have been more catered to what I need. And we have an assessment tool that will take care of that. We just have to make sure that we, we as a state office oversee and make sure they're done. But the resources are available for people who don't have insurance and don't have the willingness to pay. But if you have insurance, please, by all means, use it. Thank you. Um, Carissa, you know, we've we've had the doctor panel on uh, before us, but in terms of primary care physicians, what can they do to be more proactive about educating folks? You know, whenever I think of what physicians can do, I'm primarily thinking of it from a a youth prevention perspective. So I'm thinking about pediatricians primarily. And so pediatricians can certainly make this a part of their screening whenever they see their patients, their adolescent patients and and young patients, but also um, having conversations with parents too. Um, Sometimes pediatricians can uncover things and intervene early um, if they make that a part of their routine conversations with their young patients. And Melody, you mentioned a little bit at the beginning, but you want to go into a little bit more detail about how you guys intervene when you do have a problem? Absolutely. Uh, We are very fortunate at Hoover to have dedicated funding for interventionists. We have a zone intervention plan that seeks to balance student education with parent education. We have um, five, well actually six, committed licensed social workers who act as those intervention counselors, one at each of the high schools, one at all our alternative school, and then we have three that are based in the middle schools and who float between the middle schools and the elementary schools. Uh, all of those people work together to coordinate our programs and to plan, and that model is evaluated every year. Um, this year we are already planning, in fact we already have on the books, numerous Um, symposiums for parents in each feeder zone of our school system so that we can talk specifically, bluntly, and very honestly about heroin, about how kids end up, how good kids end up in very, very bad situations. Um, We know that a 
good bit of the education that we do with students doesn't stick back to that immaturity factor because we tell them drugs are bad, drugs are bad, drugs are bad, and they have too much evidence otherwise in society. And so they don't really buy in necessarily. They understand at that moment, but not when they get in the situation. So our goal is to be very blunt with them as well and give them a reason to pass, whether that's my mother will kill me or you know, I'm gonna lose my scholarship or I'm already involved in this and I'll be kicked off this club, out of this club or off this team. And that involves getting students engaged in activities for which they have talents and abilities or interests. The more a student is engaged in something, the less likely he or she is to succumb to pressure. Now that's not the catch-all or the be-all or the end-all, but it is one strategy. Um, another thing is to, to help parents be proactive you know, to stand up there and say, you need to look at your child's cell phone. Here are the things you need to look for. Look on your child's computer. See who your child's friends are. If your daughter becomes obsessed about weight loss, see what's helping her lose eight pounds a week. You know, that's not normal. Um, and mainly just to, to let parents understand good kids get caught in the drug trap every day, every hour. They hide it, they do everything, but brothers and sisters come home from college, they've smoked pot secretly in high school, so they're very open to drug sharing in school. You know, I have a test, so I borrowed someone's Adderall, or, you know, they, those inhibitions go further and further away from them the more deeply they get involved. And then they come home for break, and younger brothers and sisters, or friends still in high school, are um, made privy to those much more serious kinds of drugs than normally they would get. So, I mean, I, there is just no substitute for blanketing your community with information. And Carissa, what model do you see emerging as a means for change in terms of prevention? Do we have access to it? Yeah, okay, good. Um, I, this is not my model. I didn't create this. Um, this is the social development model of prevention. Um, it was created by a couple of researchers out in uh, Washington State, uh, Hawkins and Catalano. And I first got introduced to this in 1993 whenever I was working in a community, well, Culla County, Florida. Very, very, <laughs> lots of dirt roads down there. Um, it was a very interesting community. And so I started to work with a, a group called uh, Partnership for Drug Free Wakulla County. And that's how we, we did, stumbled upon this. And we were trying to look at a way to engage the entire community in this. Because we, we kind of were getting that concept of we knew we needed multiple strategies over multiple sectors in prevention. We knew that we needed to engage a lot of community people. But we also wanted to be intentional about it. So that, this is where the model came from. So it's been around for a while, and it's certainly been honed over, over the years. Um, and a companion to this is also they, uh, these two researchers, researchers came up with a list of risk factors in communities and protective factors in communities. So for every community, you have to you know, assess what are your unique risk factors for drug use, and then what are your unique protective factors for drug use. And within that, then you start looking at kind of this framework of how do you bring everybody together and what does it sort of look like. And I really loved, I actually stole this tree. I don't know who to give credit for for the tree, but I love the tree because it, it took it from being a real boring model to something that shows life and growing and, and you know, something very positive. But we all know, we st our, our kids, we all start out with these individual characteristics. And then if we look at, if we give them the proper skills, and whenever I say skills, I mean education, um, like, for example, prevention education. We've got to move away from in the school district just talking about drugs and just say, no, that doesn't work. We've got to look at what are the social and emotional competencies that kids need in order to make good decisions about in all aspects of their life. Um, and then as they get older, around middle school, that's whenever you'll throw in a little bit more about the how, do you be a, how are you going to be a wise consumer? How are you going to look at the general culture and make positive decisions based on the information that you're receiving from that environment? Um, so we've got to make sure that we're giving the, those skills, and I'm really talking about those three types of skills. Um, we've got to be able to provide them with opportunities to bond and connect with pro-social activities. Someone was talking about basketball and stuff like that. Those are all the lots of different opportunities um, for kids to bond with, with pro-social groups is really important to have a rich environment in that. And then also giving them recognition whenever they do the right thing, recognizing them, uh, you know, patting them on the back instead of, you know, kids always getting attention when they do the wrong thing. 
you know, let's make sure that we're building in intentional ways to recognize them. And then we support that in bonding and attachment to the community, to the family, to whatever their pro-social group is. Maybe it's church, maybe it's a youth program, whatever it is. But within that context, we've got to support that through talking to them about healthy beliefs. You know, I, whenever I talk with teachers that are implementing curriculum, I always say keep the conversation focused on healthy choices versus unhealthy choices because that removes the judgment. You know, because you don't know where they come from and what, what's going on at home and how people are living at home and stuff like that. So really infuse the healthy beliefs in them, you know, and, and keep that conversation focused that way. Um, and then also supporting them, you know, through clear standards, what you expect of them. Be very clear about the, your expectations. No drugs, no alcohol. You know, before the age of 21, I don't want you drinking, period. That's it. No exceptions to that. Um, and then, you know, you have to, of course, as parents and in the community and even in schools, we have to set those standards, but then we also have to monitor it and we have to give consequences if they don't. And it has to be reasonable consequences. Um, and, you know, also making sure guidelines are very clear everywhere kids go. We want them to get the same message, whether they're going to, you know, their, their rec center, whether they're going to school, whenever they go, um, conversations with their little league coach, church, wherever, we want them to kind of hear that same consistent message of, what we expect of their behavior. And in doing this, if we're all working together, the major branches up there you'll see are, you know, community, school, family, and individuals and peers. So whenever all four domains of a community can come together to do that, to set those expectations, those standards, those healthy beliefs with kids, we have a greater chance of, come, you know, our leaves are going to be the healthy behaviors. I mean, that's, that's what we're hoping to accomplish, what we hope to get out of this. But we do all have to work together. And, I, you know, something, the peer component is extremely important because something Melody said really rings so true, and that is that as kids get older, parents are still the primary influence. We still have more influence over our kids than the Internet, television, pop, pop culture, everything. We still do, so we should never, never forget that. Um, but peers are, are significant too and so it's very important to monitor your kids peer group but also you know I think we should start investing more in peer programs to cultivate peer leaders that can be that positive voice that can be our eyes and ears um, in our school in Hoover School District they have a great peer helper program in Homewood we have a great peer helper program and I can't tell you how many times those are the kids who alert us to what's going on and allow us to intervene early because they understand now. They've been trained as peer helpers on when to tell, what to tell, and who to tell whenever they see that. Because kids, whenever they use, they're not using with their parents usually, although that does happen and, and we know that's true. But most of the time, whenever they use, they're going to be using with their friends. So whenever we can cultivate that group of peers that can be that positive force, um, not just among their peer group, but even in their school and in their community, um, I think that's one of the greatest assets we, we need to develop. And so that's, that's the model, and it's not mine. That's Hawkins and Catalano. Foster, um, really briefly, which is going to be hard for you, I'm sure, but what are the Thank barriers <laughs> to treatment? Yeah, I, I'm gonna, this is going to take a little while. <laughs> <laughs> Judge Owens talked about having two people sit, uh, sitting in jail waiting for a treatment bed. Uh, I would say that, uh, <clears throat> in my experience, if those people... Uh, had insurance, they probably wouldn't be sitting there because there would be other options available to them. Treatment is life-saving for people and we've got a system of care that uh, for, for, one pe for a group of people that have private insurance and insurance doesn't cover treatment like it should but it's certainly available to them. When, those, when she releases those people uh, to us and we will be responsible in, for placing them into treatment. The treatment they, that they get will not be the same treatment that they would get if they had money. That tra the treatment will be shorter, the detox period will be compressed, uh, the, the aftercare will be uh, difficult for us to coordinate and arrange because it'll probably be across multiple agencies. And all of that arises out of the fact that we don't adequately fund treatment. Uh, there are the three ways that we fund treatment are primarily Medicaid, which, which for people that can meet that low threshold of Medicaid uh, coverage, there's some treatment available that be, can be covered by uh, through Medicaid. The next 
section is uh, a, a huge group of people who are not covered by Medicaid but do not have private insurance. Uh, and for those people, it's, it can become very difficult to try to uh, get the treatment that they need, particularly if they require medication-assisted therapy. The cost for methadone treatment, for instance, is about $450 a month. The cost of Suboxone treatment is probably $500 to $600 a month. And, and so we've got a, we have a system of care where money is driving the level of care that people get and, and obviously that has to do with the survivability uh, that people have when they're, when they're using opiates and, 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 uh, and are dependent upon heroin. And so one of the things that we've got to do is to look at how do we make treatment available quickly and appropriately at the level that people need it uh, in response to the problem that we've been here talking about today. Uh, Pam, we're running really short on time. Can you give the folks that need help just a number to call from the state level that if they need some advocacy work done on their behalf? What number can they call? They can just call, and I don't have it in my head, but they can call the actual state office. And I just want to remind and to echo what Foster's saying. It's part of it is we sit in silos, and I've been hearing people say that all day. And until we start fostering co collaborations and changing the way we deliver services, they said it at the school level. Peer services work. We got to get peers out. We got. We got to. And it's an. It's a less expensive way to get services to people. And that's one of the things that I advocate for is peer services. Peer services. But I want people to know, and I'll find the number. I know my number. You can call my number. Just call three three four three five three four three six two. Call that number. I always answer and tell you where no, you're calling. No, you're never away. there. <laughs> <laughs> But the reality of it is I do want people to know that the state office exists. It's almost like sometimes people don't realize that we are the people who help that group of people as much as we can. And like Foster's saying, I want people to understand we fund all of these programs throughout the state. So it, it, it does make it difficult for those people who are sitting in jail to get beds. It does. But the reality of it is, y'all, we got something. We got to make do and start delivering services where the little bit we do have, we use it wisely because we're not always guilty of using what we have wisely.